I'm Shachar Azani, and in the news, Israel continues to face attacks in the field of public opinion, even, and sometimes because, of COVID-19. The last few months have been tough on all of us, from COVID-19 to riots and protests which swept many all across the U.S., Israel and anti-Semitism seem to have taken center stage. A report published last week by researchers at the Cantor Center at Tel Aviv University found that the coronavirus pandemic has become a vehicle, a tool really, for an intense and exceptional wave of anti-Semitism accompanied by anti-Zionist propaganda that accuses Jews and Israel of either causing the virus or standing to benefit from it. And even the recent calls for racial justice have been marred with anti-Semitic slurs, which under the shroud of these protests, one could easily smell this all-familiar scent of hatred, which we are sadly and tragically too used to. Two weeks ago, thousands took to the streets in Paris, France, to demonstrate against racism and police brutality, an event which teemed with anti-Israel and anti-Semitic slogans with signs that read Israel, laboratory of police violence, as well as racial slurs such as dirty Jews alongside Palestinian flags. Which brings me to today's segment, featuring someone very special who stands tall to defend Israel on world stage. Together, Vouch for Each Other is an Israeli not-for-profit organization founded in 2018 by a group of young Israeli Arabs, Christians, Muslims, Bedouin and Druze, who felt determined to bring about change in the Israeli-Arab society, feeling that this segment of Israeli society had taken a negative turn vis-à-vis the state of Israel, and this did not reflect how they view Israel and their feelings towards the country. The founders of Together Vouch for Each Other have taken it upon themselves to take a stand to lead Israeli-Arab society towards a positive stance towards their homeland and to bring about further integration of Arab-Israeli society with Israeli society at large. To discuss this and more, I am absolutely thrilled to have with me today on JBS, all the way from Israel, one of those who tirelessly fight for Israel, from within and without, Mr. Yusuf Haddad. Haddad stands at the helm of this organization. He is an IDF disabled veteran and a public relations activist. Born in Haifa, then moved with his family to Nazareth. At the age of 18, Yusuf decided to volunteer in the Israeli army. He was accepted to the Golani Brigade, where he served and completed a commander's course, receiving an award for excellence, after which he was placed in Battalion 51. Yusuf decided to dedicate his life to showcasing the beautiful sides of the state of Israel and the true situation of Israeli Arabs. He speaks before many audiences, especially students, and he disputes and fights organizations that boycott Israel. He recently visited South Africa, a visit about which we are about to hear more. Yusuf, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Pleasure being with you guys. Thank you very much. First of all, let me ask you, um, in your bio, it's mentioned that you're a disabled IDF veteran. Tell us a little bit about your service in the IDF. First of all, how come? It's a well-known fact that not many Arab Israelis joined the IDF. What drove you to join the IDF? Well, to be honest with you, to answer this question, I really need to go back to where I was born. And I was born in Haifa, and also I was raised in Nazareth. Now, Haifa is the biggest mixed city in Israel. And Nazareth is the biggest Arabic city in Israel. Right. Now, surrounding Nazareth, we have today, what's it called, Nofa Galil, but before that, it was Nazareth Elite, and Afula, and Gala Emek. And in Haifa, the biggest mixed city, I had Jewish friends, Druze friends, Muslim friends, and Christian friends. And this is how I grew up. I grew up uh, playing football, by the way, with my friends, not really caring if you are a Jewish or a Christian or a Muslim or a Druze, we were all together. Uh, and the, the common thing between us is that we love football, but we also uh, Israelis. Uh, so that's how we grew up. And when I arrived at the age of 18, uh, my Druze friend and the Jewish friends, they got uh, their first order to go and to serve in the army, but I didn't get it. Now, I asked the question and... You know, to be honest with you, I know the answer, but still I, I asked the question, why? Eventually, I'm an Israeli, and last time I checked, uh, 
uh, the, the army here, it's called the IDF, not the JDF. It's not a Jewish defense force, it's an Israeli defense force. And I am part of Israel, and I'm an Israeli. And when the IDF um, fights and protects the, 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 the country, it also protects all the societies in Israel, Arab and Jews. Um, so I eventually decided to um, volunteer to the army. Uh, not only I did the volunteer to the army, but I went to the uh, best brigade in the, in, in the IDF, which is Gulani. Um, if you ask me why I choose Gulani, uh, basically it's one, because it is the best brigade in the IDF, and second, people intend to say that I'm a little bit crazy. Maybe it's true. Um, anyway, so I decided to go as a fighter. I, I want to stop you there for a minute, Yusuf. You decide you want to go volunteer, and yeah. then you go to the IDF and you say, Hineni, here I am? Basically, I, I, I literally called the recruiting officer in Tiberias, and I said, hi, my name is Yusuf Haddad, and I want to serve in the IDF, but I want to serve in Gulani. I remember his answer. It was very, uh, very interesting and amusing answer because he said, eh, this is not the grocery shop. It's an IDF, it's an army, and you cannot ask what you want or demand what you want. And I said, I don't have to uh, serve in the IDF. I can go and just travel in South America. <laughs> but eventually, a few days later, they literally called me and said, if you pass all the exams, you're in. You're accepted to the Galani Brigade. And that's exactly how it was. Uh, a few days later, they called me. They said, you got it. You, you got the, your demand, we accepted it. Just come here, pass what you need to pass in terms of, uh, uh, of medical uh, examination and everything, and you'll go in. And I did it. Yes, you did. And it's mentioned, uh, again, that you are a disabled Army veteran. So tell us a little bit about your Army service. What years, what so, did you do? So I started my service in 2003, and Shahar, I must tell you something. You know, you asked me before that, before I jumped into the uh, uh, why I'm a disabled veteran, you asked me a really uh, interesting question, question why I decided to serve in the army. And I've, I've already told you a big part of the reason, but to emphasize this and to show you how much I was so sure of my decision, um, unfortunately, one month before I started my service, on the 4th of October, 2003, a female suicide bomber came to the Maxim restaurant in Haifa, and she blew up the restaurant, ended up killing 17 civilians. I, I remember that yeah. very well, and I'm sure many in our generation remember it very well. The thing is that four of those 17 civilians were Israeli Arabs. At that day, exactly, I understood that terrorism doesn't really care if you're an Arab or you're Jewish. As long as you're Israeli, you are a target for terrorism. And as I said, when I started my service in the army, I knew that I am going to protect and serve my society in general, Arabs and Jewish. So I started my service, and uh, I must say that uh, I also become um, a commander. Uh, back then, it was uh, not so trivial, so I was among few Arab Israelis to become a commander in the IDF. And Shahar, I'm going to say it as it is, how we say, on the table, uh, because I, I, during my years, I hear a lot about Israel being a part of the country. And I always say, guys, you now are you have, you're meeting or you're actually seeing an Arab Israeli who was a commander in the IDF on Jewish soldiers. This is not apartheid. So you can use that. Uh, there you go. You say, I, I saw this guy on TV. He's an Arab. So... I want, I, I, want, I want to emphasize that, Bont Yusuf, for our JBS viewers. Remember what you're looking at, because nothing speaks Israel more than the facts. And the fact that you're witnessing here is an Arab-Israeli commander and the IDF who commanded Jewish soldiers and others. So between that and the accusations labeled at Israel, there is absolutely no daylight. Absolutely. So to jump to your question... Uh, which is exactly two months before I was supposed to um, finish my service. Um, I participated, participated in the Second uh, Lebanon uh, War. In Summer of 2006. Unfortunately, I lost uh, uh, three commanders, seven friends and soldiers um, under my command. Uh, it, is, uh, it was terrible, but uh, if, I, if I may say something about those guys, because... Please. For me, a lot of people would they look at me and say, what I hear you are doing or what you're doing for Israel, I would say that the true heroes are exactly those who are not with us because they protected us 
and they cannot tell their stories. But you know what? In a way, I'm here and I can tell their, their stories. And roughly just to say two simple stories about my commander, Rui Klein, who jumped on a grenade just to save his crew. While, by the way, shouting Shema Israel, and people need to imagine this, yeah? Someone throws a grenade, you have less than three, four seconds until it comes to your, uh, where you are, your area, it's even one second left to take a decision, what you're gonna do? And he decided to save his crew. This is a hero. A hero is when I, when we go to try to evacuate some of the uh, 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 soldiers that were very badly wounded, and they would say, don't treat me, go treat my friend. This is a hero. For me, uh, it's important to uh, acknowledge this and to say to all the viewers about the true heroes of, uh, of our uh, soldiers. As, as for me, uh, two days before ceasefire, at the 10th of August, I was uh, badly injured. Um, the story started around 5 o'clock uh, a.m. Uh, when we heard a huge explosion and then we understood that our tank, a tank that was actually very close to us, uh, got hurt by an anti-tank missile. And as we are the closest uh, force to the event, uh, we, were, we, we were the ones to go and evacuate uh, and rescue the uh, team. When we went there, unfortunately, all of the crew, four members of the crew of the tank, they were badly injured. So we had to evacuate them back to a point where a chopper can take them to Israel. Uh, we planned everything that was supposed to take about uh, 35 minutes, but unfortunately you plan something, but in war you have different result, result and it took us more than an hour and a half. So we found ourselves as a rescue team going back to our shelter uh, at daylight or around seven o'clock in the morning. And Hezbollah was waiting actually for us. And in a way we were like sitting ducks. So while I was uh, uh, leading uh, my, uh, my unit and going towards uh, uh, the shelter, they, Hezbollah decided to shoot the same rocket that they shot on the tank, they decided to shoot it at me. I was very lucky that it didn't hit me, otherwise I would be in a thousand pieces, but it just bypassed me and hit a wall that was very close to, close to me. From the explosion, I flew in the air and I landed on my belly. I understood that I was injured. I understood that I was injured badly because I had a huge cut on my face and, and I felt it in my body. Uh, when I turned on my back, I saw that my foot was cut off and you know, immediately start shouting, my foot was cut off, my foot was cut off. I was very uh, fortunate that my unit immediately uh, rescued me and they gave me the first uh, treatment. And from there, uh, they rescued me to a point where a chopper can take me back to the, to the hospital, to Israel. And even though, or actually while they're rescuing me, Hezbollah was waiting. So they, while we're doing the rescue, I was on a stretcher. Uh, and Hezbollah is shooting RPGs and shooting at us. But eventually, um, the team managed to bring me safe to a chopper and from there to a hospital. And then um, from there, one year of rehabilitation until uh, I got back on my feet again. Wow. Well, first of all, we're all very happy that you're with us today. And thank you for your service for the state of Israel and for mm -hmm. the people of Israel. I have to ask you, you're a very unusual character in the Israeli landscape. And I, I'd love to know, as I'm sure all of our viewers would love to know, what kind of reactions are you getting for your work and activity, both within Israel and within Israeli Arab society, and more interestingly, in the general landscape of, you know, globally and the Arab world? So I must tell you that I am a unique only because I speak loud. But like me, there is a lot. And the fact that now I have the opportunity, Shachal, to present this uh, on TV and talk about it, this is exactly what I actually was aiming to do. Because usually what you will see on the news, on the social media, is exactly the opposite of me and my friends and the people who are literally thinking like me, but they are just not talking out loud. So first of all, thank you for that opportunity. And the second, this is exactly the, the, the issue. Like me, there is a lot in the Israeli Arab society. Like me, there is a lot of people thinking that we need a change. But unfortunately, the extremists from both sides are right now controlling, and they are the minority. They are the minority. 
but they are louder, they are more violent, more extreme, and that's why right now they are controlling. But eventually, when we started our, joy, our journey two years ago, we started by one, two, three people, and now we are thousands of uh, people following uh, our uh, 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 organization and, uh, and literally believing in this agenda that say very simple thing. We live in Israel, and as an Israeli Arab, we should be a part of the Israeli society to be more integrated, to influence and affect actually uh, our society and the, in the country, to be in higher position, and literally to say that, hey, we are Israeli Arabs. We are proud of being Arabs. We are proud of being Israelis. And more and more people are joining our, uh, our organization, and we are very happy about that. And this is something that um, it's amazing because when you almost start from something that you don't really know um, how it will develop and you will see right now that what you believe in, it's actually happening. That's a big and huge uh, news for us. So the comments are very uh, positive. Obviously, obviously there is bad comments and uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I do get threats, but the threats that I get, it's from the same group of extremists that for them, we are some sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we, we threat them. We are a threat on them because we are finally breaking the chain of what they always fed us. And that's why that's they're afraid. Do, that's you why they feel, do you feel um, sometimes that you're risking your life doing what you do? It's not about being afraid or not. I am careful. I am careful. Um, but uh, I really see the bigger pic picture here. And I believe, first of all, that uh, if there is some sort of a, uh, an actual threat, that the Israeli police will take care of it. Um, and I do believe that uh, when I see the surrounding around me, the people that surround me, uh, and the, that, that the fact that there are more and more people are joining, um, I feel more secure and uh, confident in continuing uh, our uh, journey. Oh, you are, you are definitely a positive force within Israeli society. I want to ask you about the, uh, the Arab world in general. Have they heard about your activity? They must have seen you on TV speaking for Israel, maybe on your visits uh, abroad. What kind of reactions are you getting there, especially being able to converse with them in Arabic? So Shaha, one of the most amazing things that I can tell you about is I did actually um, a short video uh, with the uh, foreign ministry uh, they have this uh, uh, small uh, department that called the Arabic uh, Digital Department, uh, uh, and and they are quite amazing. So we did this video together, and uh, it became viral uh, around the Arab world. More than I think millions of views uh, in terms of uh, or in, on Facebook and you know, YouTube and Instagram and Twitter, and. Um, and I've actually talked about myself and about my uh, city, Nazareth, the biggest Arabic city in, uh, in Israel, and about the coexistence between the Jews and Arabs and how they work together, uh, hospitals and the, the, the fire departments, police, and, 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 and just daily uh, uh, life uh, together. And as I said, it become really viral, uh, viral video. And um, since that video was published, I... I got thousands of messages from people from Gaza, from Jordan, Lebanon, Syria. And what are they telling you, Yusuf? What are they telling you? Most of the uh, messages were, first of all, we had no idea, no idea that this is the reality in Israel. The second, can you help us come to Israel? We want to visit Israel now. That's like the more, most of them. Some of them, by the way, would say, Please help us get an Israeli identity. <laughs> <laughs> this is how huge it was because they know that Israel is the only democratic state in the Middle East. They know that. But they don't have a literally proof for that. And finally, they, 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 they saw a video and it was really crazy because they, they literally saw something visual to them and not just by saying and hearing about it all the time. But you know what? I'll give you one more example. This was even crazy for me. Uh, someone from Gaza. Now, you must understand that the internet in Gaza is restricted. So Hamas controls uh, um, the, 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 even when you go and search, Google search, they control it because they restrict you. And uh, when, that, when that video become viral because they, the, the Arab world shared it, 
uh, it actually sort of a passed the uh, restrictions of, of Hamas, and somehow it actually ended up also for uh, to see to be seen by Gaza uh, people in Gaza. And he said, "You know what? I'm probably less than a hundred kilometers away from you, and right now." You opened my eyes. The, the, the person from Gaza who texted me he said, "Right now, you opened my eyes, but I didn't thought that you can actually vote." I said, "Not only we, we can vote, we have member in the Knesset, Arab member in the Knesset." He said, I, I, "We didn't. We don't know that. We we think that you're living under an apartheid regime, and they are even referring not just to the Palestinians in in, in, in the West Bank. They are referring to the Israeli Arabs living in Israel." In Nazareth, in Shfamer, in, in even the, the, the mixed cities like Haifa and Akko and Lud and Ramle. So, so, so for, for this guy, it was a new information that I revealed to him, that we revealed to, the, to him. Uh, and I'm sure we did that uh, among others. That's why it's so vital and important to do what we're doing. And we are going to keep doing it. Uh, in, in I, South America, in America, in South Africa, all over. So, so let me, that leads me to my next question, because not only do you keep on doing it internally and externally, you, during COVID-19, you decided to travel to South Africa and speak up for Israel. Share with us a little bit about that visit. Literally before COVID-19 started here in Israel, um, I had the opportunity uh, to fly to South Africa during the, the BDS apartheid week. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and actually, I was the only one from Israel, as a representative from Israel, that managed to fly and arrive to South Africa. People over there in the Jewish community, they called me the lonely soldier. I got a lot of uh, nicknames, but uh, this one uh, was really interesting. Literally. Literally, I was, <laughs> literally, I was in front of the line against the BDS yeah. and by myself. But, An you know, army, I, army of one. Yep. An army of one, but I promise you that um, uh, me and uh, the students uh, from the Jewish community, as well from the pro-Israeli students community, we, we did an amazing uh, job. And uh, one of the most amazing things that I, I had a debate live uh, on, 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 on the main uh, TV station uh, in, in South Africa, uh, and it was a live debate with the BDS leader, um, uh, Muhammad Desai. Uh, uh, with all humble, I say that uh, I say, but I totally uh, crushed him, and it was easy for me because I literally had just to say the truth, uh, and I knew that he was going to lie. So, uh, you know, lying on, on on lying on TV or national TV and live TV, it was uh, such a dumb act from him, especially when Israeli Arab uh, sitting just next to him. Yeah, wor- so, weren't they surprised, Yusuf? Suddenly, all of their all of their stigmas shattered because they're sitting not with an Israeli Jew, but with an Israeli Arab, supposedly. And, so and the, supposedly, the, thing is, yep. the thing is, they didn't know how to handle it. Exactly. They didn't really know how to handle it. And I brought something a bit different. Because in terms of Hasbara, in terms of how we go and talk about Israel, uh, in our organization, Together About for Each Other, we have... Uh, 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 specific tactics that we uh, we, we do, uh, and it's a bit different from any other uh, tactics or any other uh, uh, method that uh, other organization, for Israeli organization, uh, uh, use. Which is first, uh, not to be afraid to talk about stuff that Israel do in terms of bad things, because we should acknowledge that and we should say, hey, uh, we are not perfect society. If if you ask me if we have racism here, yes, we have racism. But on the other hand, show me one society that you don't have racism, unfortunately. And second, and which is, this is the most important one, we need to stop apologizing. And we need to attack back. Defending and apologizing, it's actually literally giving, uh, giving them the opportunity to attack us more and uh, maybe even in a way to agree with that uh, system. So we stopped doing that. And we said, we are going to attack back. And when there's a liar, we're going to show it uh, immediately, not waiting for him to finish his lie. And this is part of what happened on the, uh, on the interview, during the interview. He stopped lying, I immediately cut him. I didn't wait for him to finish his, uh, his lie. And obviously, I attacked back uh, by exposing more lies and more activities that they, they did. Um, the, um, the, the effect of that interview was huge. So, Shaha, just a few minutes after the interview, one of the, um, uh, 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 of the extremist political parties in South Africa, they called the EFF, 
they reach out to the Jewish community and ask specifically that I come and speak to them. Now, just to give you a brief, huh? That's very the leader, important. The leader of the EFF, the nickname of, this, of their leader is the South African Hitler. That's their nickname. That's his nickname. Just to let you know, to understand how anti-Israeli they are and how they are misled uh, and brainwashed by BDS and more uh, active, uh, anti-Israeli activists. So they specifically requested me to come and speak to them. I drove from Johannesburg into this poor area, uh, 50 minutes out of Johannesburg, only to meet the EFF uh, members, political members. At the end of that talk, one of the members, he looked at me and he said, I didn't know anything. This is the first time you exposed this to us. Uh, in an instant, I had an Israeli flag with me in my pocket. I just took it and said, now, that, now it's the time for you to take a photo with me with the Israeli flag. And we did that. I have this photo uh, with the members of the EFF, uh, and we are taking a photo with just an anti-Israeli political party, and they're having a photo with the Israeli flag. So this was uh, crazy. Quite incredible. Uh, now we have a very short time left, so let me ask you very quickly two quick questions. One is there is a discussion about serving in the IDF and the, what we call the national public service. You yeah. are talking about a movement within Arab-Israeli society. What do you think about the two options? Well, first of all, as an IDF uh, uh, veteran, I would say that any Israeli Arabs who want to uh, volunteer for the IDF, we will support. But as an organization, we are calling to volunteer to the national uh, service because we believe this is actually how we say in the middle line. This is, this is exactly the, um, uh, the solution because our motto is to serve the country and at the same time serving your community. You can do it in the schools, you can do it in, 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 in hospitals, police departments, fire departments. And this actually gives you a really good solution to serve the country and still stay in the community and serve your community. So we are ruling for that, and that's our aim. And uh, Shahab, to give you a small, small statistic um, about yeah. it, in a year, there is 18,000 volunteers. 5,500 of them are Israeli Arabs. Most of them are coming from the Muslim community, yearly. So every year, there's 5,500, and we are aiming to grow this number more and more from year to year. I just want to echo what uh, your message, Yusuf, and say that even though your work is unbelievable and you are doing so much, it's important for everyone to do their share to bring together Israeli society as one. I can tell you that I myself decided, um, myself and a couple of others, to take Arabic in high school because being part of Israel and recognizing the fact that so many of Israel's citizens are Arabs, it's super important for us to be able to understand each other and be part of Israeli society as a whole. And having you in the minds of all of our viewers who want to stand up, not for Israel, but for the truth, for justice, and to making things right in the world, are proud uh, to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your service. And thank you for sharing your inspirational story with us and your courage. It was a pleasure having you on JBS, Yusuf. Thank you, Shah, and thanks to all of you. It was a really a pleasure for me as well. Thank you. You know, it's inspirational for us to see all citizens of Israel, Jews and Arabs alike, fight shoulder yeah. to shoulder for justice, not only in the IDF, but beyond, both within Israeli society as well as internationally, remembering that at the end of the day, we are all in the same boat. We are all in this together. And together is the only way we can win, evolve, and prosper. I'd like to thank all of you for watching. And to all and I said, stay safe. Other. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. I'd like to thank our directors, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, our technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shahar Azani. Thank you so much for joining me. Until next time, see you soon. Later.